Hello and welcome back to Adventurous Way. After more than a week of almost non-stop rain, it has rained every day in the past week, we have finally got a little bit of a break and we have some dry weather and today we're going to be working on our septic system. So let me give you a little bit of a walkthrough for our septic system and what we've got. Behind me you can see here the tanks. Over this side we have the septic tank and then this one here is the pump tank. On the outlet side of the pump tank down here, you may be able to see there is a, a piece of white pipe way down there, I see if I can even point to it, down there at the bottom. And that is the outlet from the pump tank, specifically the outlet from the pump. And the outlet there is going to feed everything that's inside the tank up to our leach field. And the way it gets there is up this trench. So this is a pressurized line. This is going to be inch and a half PVC um, pipe that runs up here and this will contain all the effluent from the, the tank there. It will be pumped periodically under pressure, so every so often when the tank reaches a level, it'll pump about 150 gallons at a time up through this pipe up to our leach field. The pump will then be shut off by the float switch when it gets to the low point in the cycle. What we wanted to do at that point is to drain back. So inside the pump tank, there's going to be a weep hole, a little small hole, drilled into the pipe inside the tank. When it's under pressure, yes, a little bit will come out of there, but more importantly, when the pump shuts off, any liquid left in the pipe will drain back. And that is really important because that draining back is going to empty the pipe, which means there won't be any liquid in the line to freeze. However, for that to work effectively, the pipe can't have any low spots. It can't sag anywhere. Otherwise, all the liquid will just rest in that low spot. So it's really important that we have a steady, constant, positive grade all the way up. And that is not easy. So we have laid out a mason line in here and we are currently putting some sand in. The sand will make sure that if there's any vibrations in the pipe caused by the pump turning on, the pipe won't rub against any sharp rocks and damage the pipe. Give us a nice, smooth, firm uh, kind of surface to put the pipe on. We're gonna put a plate compactor on this sand as well. That will really pack it down, same as we did the conduit in the trench for the electric. Once that's done, we can make sure this is a real smooth, steady grade. And that's more important for this one than it was for the electric. Hopefully that will then get everything up to the top. We are also gonna be running a piece of conduit in here as well. That is not gonna be power for anything related to the septic. That is actually going to be another conduit for some ethernet cable. So we can put a couple of cameras up here, maybe even put like a, a, a trail cam type thing up here with some power. And uh, so we're just gonna put an inch, uh, one inch conduit alongside the, uh, the inch and a half PVC for the liquid. So for now, We've been running the tractor, Diana has been hard at work with a rake and with a shovel, getting all of the, uh, the sand spread out. We don't have the plate compactor here on site, we're gonna get that uh, hopefully tomorrow and then we can really pack it down. But for now we're kind of doing a, a first pass, if you like, to, uh, to get it pretty close to the grade that we want. And for now we are checking the grade with um, the small line level, so you attach it to the mason line and it kind of hangs. But after the plate compactor we'll uh, come back with a laser level and just really make sure that the slope is um, right. Yeah, it's really hard sometimes to gauge. Like you sort of look down the, the line here and it's really hard to tell, is that level or is that sloping or, or what? So rather than going by eye, we are going to use technology to tell us. So the, the, the line level is a good start, but the, the laser will be our our real truth test. Especially since we've learned that on this property, <laughs> what this level is really, really hard to tell by eye. It really is. And so then once that's in, um, because it is so shallow, we are gonna end up having to put some insulation, some foam insulation board on top of the pipe as well. So we'll probably put the pipe in, put a little bit of sand just to, uh, to pack it in, uh, get all that sort of compacted down and, and, and level. And then we'll come back with some foam insulation board cut into probably two foot widths put that on top, then we'll backfill that with some more sand and then finally some uh, some backfill, general fill on top. For today, our project is get all the sand in here, get this to a, a first state of level, and then we may turn our attention to the tanks themselves. We did have a little bit of an issue the other day, so as well as all of the, the rain over the weekend, we also had some strong winds and you may have seen in that shot earlier of the tanks, we have a little visitor. We had a tree come down and land on the tanks, fortunately didn't hit anything and damage anything. But you can see here, this tree landed straight across the tanks, fortunately missed the post and the, the electrical stuff that I'd put in over there. That's not wired up yet, but it is all kind of in position, ready to be wired. So at some point I'll also grab the chainsaw and just buck this down into pieces that we can move out of the way. You can see it did, it did break the, 
the wooden brace here. It obviously kind of bounced down and, and took that piece out and, uh, and broke that, but that wasn't doing anything at the time. By, uh, by that point, I already had plenty of fill material. There's about three or four feet of, of crushed rock holding that post in place, so that's not going anywhere anyway, but need to get this out of the way as well. So once we're done with the sand, I'll probably come and work on some of the wiring here and also get the conduit, maybe the first part of that done around the back here. We still need to put in a mushroom vent. So this outlet here on the, the pump tank, we're gonna have a, it's actually not a mushroom. Uh, oh no, it is. So there's, there's two ways we can do this. We can either do a mushroom vent or a candy cane vent, they call them. You may have seen these, it's just a, it kind of looks like a candy cane, an upside down U shape. We're going with the mushroom vent style. So this will be a piece of pipe that comes up and out. And uh, that is really just an air vent for the pump tank. So any buildup of air in there, as well as letting air come back in when the pump runs and pushes all the liquid out, we need some way to get air back into the system. We opted for the mushroom vent for two reasons. One, we think aesthetically it looks a little bit better. And secondly, the mushroom vent actually has activated carbon inside the top, which means that the any smells that come from inside will hopefully be neutralized by the activated carbon. And because the septic tanks are just here and the final house is gonna be just there, it is gonna be quite close to the house. We didn't want any chance of smells uh, coming up. And then the last thing to do on the tanks, actually, sorry, two more things. One is to get this piece of pipe installed here. This long white pipe is gonna go between the two tanks is gonna have a couple of baffles on the end and that's what's going to allow the fluid from the septic tank to drain across into the pump tank as it hits that level. The last thing to do is then going to be install the, uh, the inlet here to the septic tank. Now this is the inlet where all of our waste from the house, from the utility building, from the RV, everything will come into. We're still debating, do we put in the full line all the way over to the utility building yet or not? We have excavated it and then backfilled it. So we know we don't need the rock hammer to get through and make that trench. It can be done just by a regular excavator, even a mini excavator now. However, we're kind of limited on the depth of that. You can't go too deep on that because you need to be at the right height for the various buildings and the tanks and things to get the right slope. And the depth of that, it's, it's not bad, it's a few feet, but it's only a schedule 40 pipe that we would put in. And I'm a little concerned about all the big heavy trucks that are still got to come back and forth across here concrete trucks, delivery trucks, dump trucks, all these different things. It just feels like that's a recipe for damaging that, that piece of pipe. So one option that we're considering is just putting an outlet, or sorry, a clean out in here next to the inlet. For the time being from the RV, we can either run a macerator pump over to here, we could park the RV nearer here to reach it with a regular sewer hose, or even just use those portable containers, the Blue Boys, to, to bring the waste over and dump in here manually. It's not ideal, but maybe it's a short term until a little bit more of the construction work is done here. That might be safer than putting the line in. If we do put the line in, we may look at concrete capping it or um, sleeving it or something. Problem with concrete capping is we know we've got to run other lines that potentially cross that one, and then we've got to deal with the concrete that's in the way and everything else. So it kind of makes it harder. We haven't decided, but for the time being, I'm at least gonna put a clean out and a stub in here, just so that we've got something connected to this and we can start to backfill the tank. So that's the plan. That's what we're up to today. As you can see, there's a lot of just material moving. So we're gonna get on with that and then turn our attention to some of the plumbing. done with putting the sand in the trench now the next step is going to be to compact that and we'll get the compactor uh, tomorrow from from our friend let's see how the trench looks we have the sand laid at the bottom of the trench so now we're going to compact it so whenever you're laying any kind of pipe or conduit you always want to make sure that it's on sand there's nothing sharp or big in there that's going to damage that pipe or that conduit you also wanna make sure the sand is compacted. And really that's to make sure that the pipe isn't gonna settle. If it settles, you're gonna get uneven load on that pipe and it could damage the pipe if, if it starts to bend or stretch or anything. Specifically right now, what we're doing is we need this particular uh, trench to be a very, very smooth, careful, kind of gradual climb. We don't want any high spots and low spots uh, where water could collect. The trench, the sand we've got in here is pretty thin. And sand doesn't compact that much, but it does compact some, and the thicker areas are gonna compact more than the thinner areas. So by putting the compactor over it now, we'll actually reveal any of those thicker spots where we need to add a little bit more sand to really get that smooth surface that we're after.
putting on would be a good start. <laughs> You can really tell the difference between the area that I've just run the plate compactor over down or up there and this bit behind me here where I haven't been yet. You can see whenever you walk on the uncompacted sand it leaves footprints whereas up here I've been walking behind the machine and you can see there's no no footprints in the sand there. You can really tell the difference it really feels much much firmer uh, after you've compacted it which is exactly the point. This is actually looking really good. This has come out better than I was expecting. I was kind of expecting this to be fairly uneven and that we would need to put some more sand in and compact it again but just looking at it now it's looking pretty good. I'm going to do this in two more sections here. I'll do this uh, this first section now and then I'll do the, the bit where it drops down. The final drop down there is to the tank. That's fine. It doesn't matter the gradient changes as long as it never gets flat or goes uphill. Uh, that's the main thing. While I'm doing this, Diana has gone to get the laser and then we're basically going to spot check every couple of feet all the way up and make sure that this is constantly climbing and that we have that grade that we need so that anything left in the pipe can drain back down towards the tank. Overall, I don't think this is looking too bad, actually. Uh, there's a little section here where you can see we've got a couple of high spots. So this is what we're struggling with in this trench. It's just we couldn't get the depth we wanted. And there's a little bit of a high spot there and a low spot, which it's actually, it never gets flat, but the pipe gonna have to bend over that. And I'm not sure I love that. So I think we wanna put a little bit more sand in just there. I just set up a laser at the end of the trench and um, with the laser, I kind of went down and just double checked that there is a continuous slope downward and we won't have any low spots. And it all checked out and uh, it looks good. Well, the work on the trench is now done. We've been through the compactor. We've put some extra sand in a few places and compacted that down as well. And I'm really pleased with it. It's looking really steady, really smooth. Diana's been down with a laser and checked and we've got a good grade all the way down. So fingers crossed, that is uh, exactly what we need for the pipe. Speaking of which, you may think that the next step now is to install the pipe, but not just yet. And the reason for that is before we cover up the pipe, we want to pressure test it to make sure that all our uh, joints hold liquid. They're not gonna leak. We do not want any leaks in this pipe for obvious reasons. And in order to pressure test it, we need a pump to get water in there. And we have a giant pump here in our pump tank, but it's not yet wired up. So in order to pump liquid into that pipe, we need two things. One is we need to wire it up. And second is we need to get some water into this tank to actually pump into that pipe. Obviously we want to get the wiring done before we put water in there, otherwise that's gonna be miserable. So next up, we're gonna turn our attention to the plumbing and electrical on this tank, get all of that stuff done so this tank is ready, then we can install the pipe and pressure test it before we backfill. All right, so the first thing I wanna do is get these wires through this piece of conduit that I installed a little while ago. So this runs through a special little fitting that I installed through the side of this riser. This riser is gonna get cut down about 10 or 12 inches to, I think this, uh, this, was it one, two, three? Yeah, about, about this height here. And that's going to be the final grade. We'll do that later. For now, I wanna get the wires that are down there through that uh, hole there, that entrance hole, up through this piece of conduit and pull them up here. And that's gonna really lift everything out of the tank. Looks like there's been, um, there's, there's a load of liquid, uh, basically condensation on the underside of this lid when I took it off. So my guess is all that water inside has been sort of evaporating off, condensing on the cold lid up here. So it's pretty wet inside there right now. I'm hoping it's gonna dry off a little bit before I have to climb in there later, because I do need to install some, some plumbing in there. I'm hoping I can reach those wires out without having to get the ladder in there just yet. One of us is gonna have to volunteer to, to hang down there. Um, I feel, Diana, that might be you, but if not, we'll just put the ladder down and climb in. So yeah, the plan now, get those wires up to here. Okay. Right.
Well, the wires are out. First step done, wasn't too hard. No, we were able to reach those out. When I say we, I mean <laughs> very much Diana was able to reach those out. So we have a bunch of wires here, as you can tell. So these two black ones that I'm holding here are the float switches. And these are the ones that have these piggyback plugs on the end that are now absolutely filthy. I'm gonna cut these plugs off. They're not gonna go through the conduit and pull up with that plug on the end, and I'm gonna hardwire them anyway. So I'm gonna pull these, or cut these plugs off, then we'll feed those wires through. I do need to make sure I get the right float switch though up here uh, to make sure I'm using the right ones. And then this white beige gray wire here, this is the actual pump itself. So that's why I'm gonna hardwire into the power with those two float switches. The other wires here, this is the um, liquid pressure sensor that I put in at the bottom. This wire is long enough to reach up through the conduit over to here, so that's great. I'll feed that through. These three smaller wires, these are the three temperature sensors and these are these are probably not gonna reach. That, that's gonna be really tight, I think, to try and get those up into there um, and they need to reach the box on the far side. It's a shame, they're so close. This one I think would actually reach and I might pull that through just as is anyway. But these other two are too short. So I'm gonna have to splice some more wire into these, same as we did for the well. I think for now, I'm just gonna focus on getting the pump wired up and, uh, and we'll pull those through separately later because the pump is the priority for now. This is one of the two uh, pigtail plugs. You can see it's got a male end and a, a female end on this uh, little connector here on the float switches. And I need to remove this so I can get it through the conduit and also so I can hardwire it. I've tried to find online what to expect when I cut this off in terms of color coding of wires and I've not been able to find anything. So I'm kind of hoping that when I cut this off, I'm gonna be able to identify the wires pretty clearly and we'll just have to see. If not, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. Um, <laughs> So, wish me luck here. Let's see what we find. Okay. Aha, that's nice and easy. So, there is a black wire and a white wire. Um, I assume these are just simply connected to the float switch and it's just a switch, just toggling on and off, much like a regular switch, light switch or something would do. And so, I'm gonna see if I can get continuity now between the male and female sides of the, uh, the hot wire here and see if I can work out which is which. My guess is one of these goes to black and one of these goes to, to white. Um, I'd like to get it the right way around so I know that power coming in is the, the right one. It probably doesn't matter, but just in case it does, I'm gonna try and get it the right way around. Okay, so I've hooked up my multimeter here, my climb multimeter, and I'm gonna try and use that just to ascertain continuity between these wires and the, the hot line on the uh, the plug. So I'm gonna wedge that in there and then see if one of these goes active. Okay. So that, I'm touching the white sheathed wire inside there. I don't know how easily the sheath is, uh, the insulation is showing up on the camera, but there's a, a white one and a black one. And so I'm getting continuity there on the white one, which means the white is on the female side of here. And if my logic is correct, that means if I stick that into the uh, male side, I get the black wire there, okay? So what this is telling me is the black wire here expects to be hooked up to, uh, to permanent power, to 24 seven power, and the, the white wire here is the switched one. So that's the one that's going to toggle based on the state of the float switch. So when I wire this up later, I'll wire it up so that the black wires have power and the, uh, the white wires are the ones that are, uh, have to be turned on in order for the, the pump to get power. So I'll just basically replace the, the, the plug with a couple of wire nuts. These three wires here are the wires from the temperature sensors inside and they are not gonna reach. I was gonna feed just the, the power wires through first and then deal with these later, but I think it's just gonna be a pain to try and fish wires through when there's already some wires in that conduit. So instead, I'm gonna splice all these together into a piece of ethernet cable, some Cat6E, same as we did on the well, 
Because of the way that these sensors work, they are addressable, so I can splice all three of these sensors into a single Cat 6E. I don't need three pieces of Cat 6E. It's not great having those in the same conduit as the, the high voltage power that's going to the pump. Um, it remains to be seen whether that will be too much interference. It is only a very short run, five, maybe six feet. Uh, and over here, there's gonna be a split between high voltage and low voltage. So they are gonna be protected that way. Um, so for now, I'm just going to cut these all to the same length and then I can join these together. I'm not gonna lie, it is horrible dealing with this stuff. I don't know if you can see, these wires here are really, really fine and they're actually stranded. The ends are, are they've got a bit of solder on to, uh, to stop them from fraying, but it's actually a real thin stranded wire in these. And the Cat 6E I'm connecting them to is a, a solid wire. They're just really awkward to deal with. They're really fragile. They want to split, they want to break. So I am going to try and actually solder these together as well as just um, kind of splicing them together. As we did on the well, I'm also going to use some heat shrink tubing. I'm also going to use some of the rubberized tape, hopefully to, to make a really good seal. So this Cat 6E cable that we're using here is gel filled and it's rated for direct burial, which we're not doing here, um, but it is waterproof, which is nice. As you start to open up the cable, and bear in mind I'm not doing ethernet, so I don't need to be quite as careful about the pairs here. They're certainly not twisted in the, the cable from the sensor. But as you look inside, it's kind of fascinating to see what the structure of this looks like. You can see this, this kind of uh, gel that's in here, it's this really sticky kind of, um, I assume oil-based gel, and that's really to, it, it bonds to the wires and stops any water getting in there. But you can see the four pairs, the blue, the orange, the brown, and the green in here. In the center, there's this plastic kind of X-shaped piece, and that holds the, the four pairs uh, separated in the, um, the main insulation sheathing. And there's also this, this piece of string in here as well. So when you open this up, um, we're gonna cut away this piece of plastic, we're gonna cut away the string. We're also not gonna use all the pairs so we're gonna cut away the ones we're not using and uh, just join up the wires we are. We do need to make sure we strip all this gel off, otherwise we won't, won't be able to get a good electrical contact on here as well. So I'm gonna start by trying to cut away the string. It's the easy part. So cut that away. And then I'm gonna cut away the plastic in the middle. Trying very hard not to damage the wires that are in here. So cut that away, nice and sticky. And that leaves me with just these four pairs then. And I think, can you remember which pairs we use for this? There's various ways to do this. As long as you get some basic rules right, it doesn't really matter too much uh, which ones you use, separating the data and the power and things. In our case, we're using a standardized system. It's just an example I found online, but it works for me. So we're using the same one everywhere, makes it very easy for us to keep track of things. This diagram, this model that we're using actually allows you to send not just the data, but separate five volt and 12 volt power down there. In this case, they put five volts on the orange, they put 12 volts on the brown, and they put data on the blue, saving auxiliary uh, ground for the green, or auxiliary green and um, five volts and ground on the green. So that means that we need the blue for data and the orange for, for voltage, basically. So I can cut away the green and the brown as not being used. The orange solid wire will then hook up to five volts. The data will hook up to the solid blue. And the two stripes, the orange and white stripe and the blue and white stripe that are left will both be tied to ground. So essentially the data and the five volts are both going to be in their own pairs with a ground wire as well. And that's designed to really help the signal um, and avoid losing uh, quality in there. So let's get these other ones cut away. I've got my wrong pliers here, but it'll work. So I'm essentially leaving just the orange and the blue pairs. Now again, if you were doing ethernet here, you'd wanna be really careful about how much you untwist these. I'm way less concerned about that because in this application, that's just not a concern for me because the 
the cables have already got 10 feet of untwisted cable at the, uh, at the start. An extra half an inch isn't going to make any difference whatsoever. What I am going to do is throw a piece of heat shrink tubing over here. Um, and I will wrap this later with the, uh, the rubberized tape. And then I can undo these twisted pairs to give me access to those wires. So there's the blue and the blue and white. Undo. It's horrible with the gel on here. Let's get these a real good clean. So essentially, you can see there now we're going to have um, five volts is going to go on the orange wire, data on the blue wire, and uh, the the two stripe wires here will be tied to ground. So I'm going to strip these back. We can then tie those onto the assembly that I just made using um, the color coding on there to map to this one. I'm using my nice clean shirt <laughs> to wipe this gel filled stuff off. So I'm now going to strip off a generous amount on here. So this is much harder doing this outside on top of a septic tank <laughs> than inside with a nice cutting mat and, well, heating, frankly. It is getting cold. Winter is coming. It really is. Okay, so there are my three wires. I've got my five volts, my ground, and my data. So time to hook these on to these three wires. This is actually a lot easier than on the well. On the well, I was trying to do a single sensor onto a piece of Cat6, and that was really, really hard because these wires are so thin. Although it was a bit of a pain splicing these three together, now I have, I've got a much more substantial piece of wire there to deal with. So, yellow goes to blue. It's the first connection I can make. Okay, then fire up the generator for me. When I tell you I want a USB soldering iron, I would like to use this as exhibit A, please. So I said at the start, I really, really don't like splicing this stuff. It's a real pain to do. I've done the best I can with the tools I've got and doing it in the field. And I hope it's going to be okay. Electrically, I feel pretty good. That's secure, especially with the solder in there. That should be a real nice, strong connection. I think mechanically, it should be fine. It's going to be protected in here. It's not a very long run. So that is the connection we've got. That now means we've got all the, the wires long enough to do the wire pull through. So we're going to pull a piece of pull rope through, tape everything onto the end, and then pull them up and through. Well, that wire pull was nice and easy. It's such a short length, it's like five or six feet. That was no issue at all. We have our three pump related wires here. So the two float switches and the pump wire itself. The other sensor wires that we pulled through, I've routed through, through this post to this back box here. Long term, the idea is basically a high voltage on this side and low voltage on this side. Uh, the exception just being poking the wires through there. For now, I'm just putting them there out of the way. We're gonna break for lunch now, but after lunch, we will come back and we will get these things wired up. I've taken the switch and the receptacle off the post over there so we can wire these up. This is just a temporary measure, again, like the well. This is so that we can power this with a generator in the short term. Essentially, we're just going to expose the hot, the neutral, and the ground wires to the, the junction box where the other wires are from this switch and inlet receptacle.
we've wired up the inlet receptacle and the switch on the back. So we've now got our hot and neutralized ground wires coming through here to this box where we're gonna make the connections. This black wire is switched so that the switch back here turns power on and off to this. This is gonna to connect to both the pump and the alarm. Now in future, you'd have these on two different circuits because otherwise if the pump trips the breaker, it also turns off your alarm, so that's no good. For the time being though, because we're gonna be running this manually with a generator, we're just gonna use the same hot wire from over here to run both the alarm and the pump. So now we're going to uh, wire in the pump float switch and the pump to this hot wire and get ready to wire up the alarm as well. Rather than wiring the pump up first, we actually decided to wire the alarm up first, mainly just to get the wires here out of the way, it gives us a little bit of a, a clearer run here in the main box. The alarm is really simple to wire up. It basically has uh, power coming in, so we have the, uh, the hot wire coming in. This, again, will ultimately be a separate branch, separate breaker, for now is just coming from the switch. We've got the neutral, we've got the ground, and then the float switch, the alarm float switch, which is the top one, connects directly onto this panel. And essentially this will just trigger if that switch closes. Uh, so we can now close this up. So that just goes back on like that. And we can shut that up. We are going around and adding uh, some sealant to all of these terminal connections as well, just to uh, try and prevent any water getting in there. So that is the alarm. This will only go off if for some reason the pump has failed and the level in the tank has risen beyond uh, where it should have done, and it's hit the alarm level. We've now got a bunch of wires here, and this white wire, this white cable coming in, this is the uh, the pump. So we're gonna split this apart, expose the the uh, the live, the neutral, and the ground in here. The grounds and the neutrals are gonna be nice and simple. It's gonna uh, hook those up directly to the ones that are in here with some wire nuts. The, uh, the live is a little bit different, so if you remember from earlier, we cut the pigtail plug off uh, these two uh, float switches. The uh, black one, I think it was, we'll double check, but the black one uh, is gonna get power, so that will be tied into the, the black wires here. The white wire from this one will tie into the live from here. And that will essentially, again, mean that the uh, pump itself is controlled by the float switch down in the tank. So, last few little connections, and then we can do a bit of a test. Right, so I've got Diana here in the septic tank or in the pump tank on the ladder. We have things wired up. So we've got all the wiring in here and I've got the generator ready to hook up there to, uh, to power this whole assembly. The switch is off on the far side. So what we're gonna do is gonna do a test now. I'm gonna power it up and I'm gonna check that we see voltage where we expect to see voltage, make sure the connections are good for now. And then um, we're gonna turn on the power. And again, I'll do some tests. And then I will try and do a test of the alarm. So there is a test button on the alarm. I want to see what that does. I imagine it will test it. Uh, so that's a good really test. <laughs> yeah. Um, after that, we're actually gonna test both the, the float switches, the alarm and the pump. We don't wanna dry run the pump very long. So it's just gonna be a very, very quick test. Really just to make sure things are working the way they should in terms of the float switches which is why Diana is down inside the tank. Because in order to test this, we need to physically raise those float switches up. So I'm gonna pass the camera to Diana. I'm gonna go and start the generator and we'll do some testing. The generator is plugged in now and I've actually put a GFCI on there as well, just to make sure that if there are any issues, we're a little bit better protected because we are running on the generator. So now I'm gonna turn on the switch up here and hopefully Diana doesn't fall off the ladder. <laughs> okay, so turning on the switch, first of all. So that is now live. Nothing should be really happening at this point.
We do have, I don't know if you can see that, the red light is on, on the, uh, the alarm there. So that's good. Sounds like there's, there's power going to the alarm. Oh, sorry, green light it is. Green light is on, on the, uh, the alarm. So we've got power there. So I'm gonna check a few of these things in here, make sure we got power. There's a bunch of different ways to test these things. I'm just using a non-contact voltage tester for now. So I should see power there on that one. I shouldn't see anything. Oh, it's picking up the live. How do I get this? It's so close to the, so it's picking up the, uh, the wire there. Did you pull it out? Maybe? Yeah. Okay, so the ground hasn't got anything. So we've got it on the neutral, got it on the live, not showing it on the ground. So we are hot, we know that much. And then the float switch is off and it's not getting the power, right? Float switches are off. So I'm gonna hit the test button on here now. Turn off my tester. This could be quite loud. I think there's a siren and a flashing light. So just bear with. Yeah. So this lights up and that alarm goes off when the alarm triggers and that is triggered by the float switch. So let's see if Diana can trigger the float switch and make that alarm sound. So I need to take the top green ball and move it up. Correct. Okay. Okay. So the alarm works. The last one to check is the pump. So okay. do it for about the same amount of time. Okay. Okay, down. Okay. Okay. Pump works and the alarm works. So both the float switches are wired up correctly. Our alarm works correctly. And if I turn off the power, our switch works correctly. So I'm happy with this. This is just a temporary setup again. I've still got a few uh, screws that I'm gonna put in over here just to, uh, to fasten all these down. We also wanna silicon a few things here or s put some sealants around a few of these, um, these junction boxes just to keep everything weatherproof. Long term, what you can see in here, there'll be another piece of conduit coming up the bottom here. And that's what will contain the, uh, the power from our utility building that will run all of this in future. For now, we are instead pulling power from the generator. And then time to time, we will plug in the generator to see whether the pump turns on and you know, gets the stuff pumped away and then will automatically turn off if when it pumped to the level that it needs to. Yeah, and I think the volume it pumps is about 150 gallons each time. So if you think when we dump our RV tanks, our, our gray and our black are 40 gallons each. So if they were completely full, it would take two dumpings for every time the pump needs to run. So there's not really a chance of us sort of going too far. There is also by specification, uh, the, the way that, that it works here for the design, there is at least a day's allowance of uh, volume above the alarm level. So once the alarm goes off, we've still got space for another day's worth of, of liquid to fill the tank. And the sizing of our tank is 560 gallons per day. That's how our entire septic system has been designed. So even when the alarm goes off, we've still got another 560 gallons worth of capacity of the tank before things yeah. overflow and get really nasty. And also, it needs a certain minimum amount before the pump tank will pump, right? Because the pump is not at the very bottom. Correct, yeah. And it's actually the other tank needs to be mostly full before anything goes into the pump tank. Yeah, so if you look over there, there is the outlet from the septic tank that's going to come across into, there's a, an inlet just on the, the side of here. So the septic tank has to reach that, that level first. And that's pretty deep. That basically means filling an, a thousand gallon tank almost. Then and only then will liquid start to come over into this one and start filling the pump tank. So it's many dumpings. So <laughs> yeah, we, and we may even, 
uh, put some water in here just to get the thing going to, to kick it off. We'll, we'll have a chat with our engineer and see what he recommends given our usage. But for now, I'm happy with this wiring. So we'll get the generator turned off. We'll get all the covers on here and get things sealed up. So the wiring is done for the septic system and it's getting close to five o'clock. So we'll call it the day today. And then tomorrow we'll continue with the plumbing for uh, these tanks, installing a mushroom and um, connecting them together with a pipe. So thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure you're subscribed so that you can follow along our journey of building our dream home in Vermont.